You all know I'm a sucker for checking out these Chinese motherboards, so when I saw an X89, I knew I had to buy one. That was probably a mistake. And by the time today's done, I might need one or two more of these. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and what do you say we just dive right in? Right around a month ago, I was rolling through eBay, as I often do, and I came across this Jingsha X89 motherboard. Now, I'm no stranger to the Chinese brand motherboards. I've worked with a number of them in the past. However, this one caught my eye for one particular reason. It's not an Intel-based chipset. This is actually using an AMD G34 base socket, which is from around the same time period of the Intel X79 boards I've looked at in the past. Why they're calling this an X89, I honestly have no idea, as X89 doesn't exist as a chipset for either Intel or AMD. My best guess is they're just trying to fall in line with the X79 naming scheme from a lot of the other boards of this kind. Doing a little bit of research before this board arrived, I actually found that there are two variants of this board, and I bought the higher of the two. However, they're sold under the exact same model name. One of them uses scavenge chipsets from the AMD FX990 platform. This one actually uses a scavenge chipset from the SR5650 server-based platform. The only difference between the two is the 990 will only support a max of 16 gigabytes of memory, whereas the server-based platform will support up to a full 32 gigabytes on the two DIMM slots. And as is tradition here on Craft Computing, we're not just gonna throw this x89 onto a test bench and benchmark it, we're actually gonna build a system with it. So let's get into today's parts. I've already introduced the Jingsha X89 motherboard, but for just $75, not only did it come with the motherboard itself, it came with a socket G34 cooler, which is really a lifesaver because there's not a lot of them out there on the market. Normally when I'm choosing a CPU to go into a build like this, I opt for the best bang for the buck performance that I can find. However, in this case, the top tier AMD Opteron is selling for just $55. So that's what we went with here. It is the 6386 SE CPU. It is a 16 core, 16 thread, 2.8 gigahertz base clock with a 3.5 gigahertz boost. I just hope this four heat pipe cooler is enough to keep this 140 watt beast of a CPU cool. On the GPU side of things, I opted to go with the EVGA RTX 2060 KO. At just 299, this is one of the best bang for the buck graphics cards that you can get today, and I'm sure we've eliminated all GPU bottlenecking that is possible with the CPU. And here's where things get a little bit more interesting, as I opted for the case to go with this Dark Flash DLM21, which is a micro ATX case and uh, also includes a power supply. We are going to toss in a full kit of Antec 120mm fans to make sure we have more than enough ventilation inside of this case. And for storage, I'm just going to dig through my goodie box and see what I come up with. So, let's get this thing together. It's four days later. The reason it's four days later is I am completely and utterly frustrated with this thing. I have spent four days of nothing but blood, sweat, and tears and utter frustration wanting to just rip this stupid little heat sink off the top of this board. But I haven't done it for science. Do you want to know how frustrated I am? Oh, 
about this much. Okay, now everything's better. So for starters, let's talk about the board itself. Honestly, quality-wise, it's nothing too unsurprising if you've looked at any of these X79 or X99 boards before. There's a couple of weird placements on the board. For starters, the 8-pin EPS connector is right next to the 24-pin connector on the board. There is no front panel audio connector. The front panel I.O. is not labeled. However, it does have a USB 3.0 front header and two USB 2.0 front headers. But the CPU mounted into the socket just fine, and the board did post with the 6386SE processor and dual 16GB sticks of DDR3 ECC registered memory running at 1866. So why am I complaining about this board? Well, as bad as the BIOSes have been on the X79 motherboards that I've looked at in the past, this is a whole new level of garbage. Typically on these boards, I don't see a lot of fan control options, and what options are there only affect the CPU fan header. Usually it's not much of a problem, I just hook up a fan hub and connect all of the case fans to the CPU fan hub. However, on this board, there is no option anywhere in the BIOS for fan control. So when we turn the system on, it just runs full blast all the time. That's enough of that. Issue number two, memory speed. There is an option to select a memory speed inside the BIOS. However, the options listed are like 533, 667, and 800 megahertz. If that is double data rate recording, then it will run up to 1600 megahertz memory. However, it doesn't actually report what memory speed it's running inside the OS. Even running programs like HW Info, it there's no option for it. It doesn't list the memory speed anywhere. I can see in hardware info that the memory DIMMs installed are capable of 1866, but nothing reports the actual speed that the memory is running at because, well, Windows can't even see it. Issue number three. You might notice this is not the case that I said I was going to use in the intro, and you might notice I cut my montage a little bit short. That's because this motherboard is not a micro ATX motherboard as was advertised in the listing. In fact, this is about half an inch too tall to fit in a micro ATX case. You would need a case with a fifth slot, which is kind of rare these days. So in the end, I have all this empty space down here that I can't even use. I can't plug in any more expansion cards, and we're already losing a slot right here because the chipset heatsink sits so far down. Uh, it's really just a poor layout and badly advertised because this is not a micro ATX board. But hey, all can be forgiven if those 16 cores really do chooch along. They don't. Again, this is an Opteron 6386 SE, and for those not familiar with the line, I'm sure there's a lot of you because this is one of the worst selling server lines in computing history. This is the 16 core variant of the Pile Driver series of AMD CPUs. If you're familiar with the 8350FX processor, which is the 8 core 8 thread AMD chip, this is basically two of those glued together. It does have a 2.8 base clock and a boost clock up to 3.5 gigahertz, making it the fastest Opteron that AMD really ever made. So we should be seeing some pretty decent performance out of it, but we don't. So it's slow, but how slow is it? Well, I ran it through Cinemench R15 and the 6386 managed a 905 multi-threaded score. And that sounds pretty low, but let me put some perspective on that. It lost to an i5-8400. That's a 6-core, six 6-threaded six CPU running at 2.9 GHz. It scored a 960, a full 55 points faster. It almost lost to a Ryzen 5 2400G, which is kind of at the bottom end of AMD's stack. That CPU scored an 882. Bump that up to a Ryzen 5 2600, that CPU scored a 1286. In fact, the slowest 16-core configuration I have ever tested was my dual Xeon E5 2690 at a 2226. And keep in mind, this CPU draws 140 watts from the wall. That is well over double what an i5-8400 draws. Heck, that's well over double what a Ryzen 5 2600 draws. And those have 10 and 30% performance increases respectively. So, how do you think the 6386SE will fare in gaming? Well, before we get to the games, let's go ahead and pull up those Cinemench R15 numbers in single-threaded mode. And scroll all the way to the bottom. This is literally the worst CPU I have ever benchmarked with AVX instructions. It lost to a 1.8 GHz i5 Ivy Bridge mobile CPU that has two cores and four threads. But to keep everything scientific, we do need to run gaming benchmarks on the Opteron. And much to my surprise, Doom actually loaded right up. 
after about four minutes on the loading screen. We ran the Vulkan API and set all the settings to Ultra as I normally do. Once into the game, we were able to play for about 30 seconds before the system hard locked. I tried benchmarking Doom three separate times with restarts in between once the screen would freeze, and I was never able to finish a recording. I could not measure the frames per second on this chip. Now, I will say it was probably above 60, but not that far above 60. And at 1080p with a RTX 2060, I should have been seeing 190 to 200 FPS on average. I think I was seeing somewhere in the neighborhood of around 85. But let me say, the crashes in Doom weren't even the worst aspect of the gameplay. It was the fact that this thing was stuttering about every five to 10 seconds and dropping out about a second to a second and a half of gameplay. It was really jarring and literally made the game unplayable. Although I could only play for about 30 seconds at a time. So I thought maybe, just maybe Doom was just a little bit too much for this system. Why don't we try something from back in its day, like Counter-Strike? And I experienced, well, the exact same thing. We got in, we played for about a minute or so, and we hard locked. At that point, I abandoned this project entirely. So to wrap things up here, this is a terrible motherboard for a terrible platform. The BIOS are among the worst I have ever worked with, and I am satisfied with the X79 boards that I've dealt with in the past, but this was absolutely atrocious. The memory support is abysmal, although this was able to boot 32 gigabytes, I have no idea what speed it was running. The CPU cooler it came with was adequate. We saw temps in the high 50s or low 60s, but that's because the fans were running at 100% all the time, again, because of the aforementioned BIOS. There's no front panel audio. There's a chipset heatsink on here that blares its fan at 100% all the time, and that's got a nasty little whine to it. There's numerous issues with layout on the board. It's not a micro ATX board, so it didn't fit in the case I expected it to. And the CPU performance on this is absolutely dreadful. It is the worst single threaded CPU I I have ever benchmarked inside of Cinebench R15, and the multi-core performance is atrocious even by eight-year-old standards. So would I recommend anything inside of this case? Well, the EVGA RTX 2060KO is a pretty solid value at 299. But other than that, no. Under no circumstances would I recommend this motherboard or this platform for any use case ever. This CPU, heatsink, and motherboard combo cost me $135. You can buy a Ryzen 5 1600AF for $85 and a B450 motherboard for sometimes around 50 to 60, making it almost identical to what you'd spend on this. And you get a CPU cooler that can handle a 1600AF. Uh, your memory is the only difference. You're gonna get 32 gigs here and you're gonna get probably 16 gigs on the AMD side of things. I will put Amazon affiliate links down in the video description for this combo, but that's your funeral. I will also put links down in the video description to a Ryzen 5 1600 AF and compatible motherboard. And that's totally the way you should go. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. If you disliked it, you know what to do and I don't like you. And make sure to subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter, at Craft Computing, to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you'd like to financially back the channel, make sure to check out the link to my Patreon. You get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. And it is one heck of a good time. But that's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, all. I'm pretty sure this would outperform that.